There's actually uh, still quite a bit of feral hemp all over Illinois. Uh, one of our members invited us out to come check out his uh, hemp harvest. He said, hey, by the way, I've got this big old patch of Illinois green over there if you want to check it out. And of course we did. Um, and it was amazing. You know, some of it was close to 20 feet tall. That's Rachel Berry, founder of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and today I'll talk to Rachel Berry about all kinds of things, including the feral hemp that grows in Illinois and other parts of the Midwest. We'll also hear about her hemp operation and why she was compelled to start the Illinois Hemp Growers Association and what that group does to help farmers in the state. But first, a quick sponsor break. Healthy hemp needs healthy soil. You can build life into your soil with King's Agri Seeds diverse and balanced cover crop cocktails that feature various rooting structures to fix nitrogen, alleviate compaction, increase biodiversity, suppress weeds, and more. Set your 2021 crop up for success by planting cover crops this fall. Call King's Agri Seeds at 717-687-6224 or go to kingsagriseeds.com. Hello and welcome back. Thanks for listening to today's show. So last week I mentioned that this week was going to be our 100th episode and I felt then that that was sort of a cause for celebration. Like, yay, we did it. But really, what did we do? It's it's just a number. I had invited listeners to call in and leave me a message if they wanted to. And I heard from Mike at Terradon Hemp. So shout out to Mike. Thank you. The rest of you I, I know are super busy. There's a lot going on. So, but as uh, my family likes to tell me, it's not all about me. It's all about hemp. And specifically today, it's about Illinois hemp. And even more specifically, it's a conversation with Rachel Berry. Here we go. Rachel Berry, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, My name is Rachel Berry. I'm the founder and CEO of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. I'm a hemp farmer. Um, I'm a first-generation farmer, um, and I'm a community advocate for hemp. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show. Um, So how did you first get started in hemp? Well, as I mentioned, I'm a first-generation farmer. Um, I I really was putting a lot of uh, thought and and research into, you know, what I wanted to do as a farmer. Um, I kind of fell into farming. It was not something that I planned to be a farmer. It just kind of happened. Um, and, it, you know, if I wanted to continue doing that, I wanted to find a crop that I could feel good about growing and, um, you know, selling, contributing to the, to the community. Um, and in my research, I, I kind of fell upon hemp. And that was a big rabbit hole for me. Um, all the possibilities of um, soil, water, air remediation, um, the the nutrient dense food, um, all the cool stuff that you can build and make out of hemp. Um, that right. that's really what just drew me and and helped me fall in love um, with the plan and and what what we can do with it. Right. Yeah. Um, a previous guest called hemp the the gateway crop, sort of gets sure. people into farming. So, um, sort of what part of Illinois are you in, and then can you sort of describe your your hemp farm? Sure. Yeah. I'm in central Illinois. I'm about two hours west of Chicago. Um, We're on about 13 acres. Uh, It's a 120 year old homestead. Um, We have a lot of uh, biodiversity here. Um, We do a lot of practice in permaculture and regenerative ag. Mm -hmm. So we like to pay attention to biodiversity. Um, We uh, and we make um, medicine out of medicinal plants. So paying attention to what's growing around us and um, uh, integrating those natural elements on the farm, um, with our hemp and with our produce. Um, you know, that's, that's a big part of how we do things. And we have our kids, uh, a big part of that as well. This is a family operation. So hemp is just a part of the, the whole operation. Yeah. Right now. I mean, this is, uh, you know, we're just learning to grow hemp. <laughs> it's only, uh, Illinois for a uh, second year, uh, other um, growing hemp. We did experiment a bit with CBD last year, and this is our first year we tried growing a dual purpose um, for fiber or grain, which came out better for grain, actually. Oh, okay. All right. Have you started harvesting that yet, or is that still 
in the yeah it's it's still in the ripening phase we've been able to go out and harvest a little bit just to like munch on here and there um you know and this year you know our we we only did um about a quarter acre so we're we're going to use what we harvest this year mostly for ourselves um you know i'm a baker um and a food enthusiast so i want to use some of this hemp seed that i grew myself to you know to feed my fa- my family and uh show folks that you can grow this this crop and you know eat it (laughs) Um, and then we have chickens and ducks that have been crazy about this seed all season and uh you know they've been so kind to help us fertilize our our fields so we want to give back a little bit and share some of that seed with them too right well what was your first year of growing hemp like how much did you grow what sort of challenges did you run into all of them we ran into all of the challenges <laughs> yeah there was timing and then there was weather and then there was even getting the hemp bill passed in time to start um mm-hmm. planting and you know we had all of the challenges um last year with cbd um and that was a big part of why we switched this year to trying our hand at grain and fiber which is really where our passion lies mm-hmm. um and it's been it's been an amazing journey I imagine the Department of Agriculture in Illinois is um, sort of pro-hemp. How is it working with with the Department of Ag out there? Yeah, yeah. The Department of Ag is pretty hemp-friendly. Um, they're enthusiastic about seeing hemp, you know, in Illinois and um, be utilized by our growers and processors and onward. Um, things are a little slower than we would like to see. Um, you know, we'd like to see better record keeping. Um, we'd like to see those fees that they're collecting for licenses be utilized a little better um and we'd like to see a little more uh enthusiasm for the varieties other than cbd but yeah they 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 are working together um with the organizations and institutions around to bring hemp you know into the main space right what is like the testing protocol out there i know in pennsylvania here there's like contracted agents that go out to a farm and take the sample and then take it to a testing lab and those results go to the Department of Agriculture? Uh, it's all over the place, Eric. Um, the protocol is that I, 10% of growers are requested to send it in. Nobody comes out. Like it's, we, there is work to be done. <laughs> hmm. all right. um, and then how about the fee structure? Like what, what are they charging farmers for a permit or a license out there? Yeah, so we have two different types of uh, licenses. You can choose a one, two, three year license for either being a cultivator or a processor. Hmm. And those run, you know, on a varying scale. Um, I forget the actual numbers. I think it's uh, 700 for three years and then it scales down from there. Oh, okay. Uh, That's kind of convenient to, to get a license for several years here in Pennsylvania. It's like you have to renew every year. And pay yeah, it is convenient. Year. It's nice to have the three year option. And that was something that um, as the bill was being gone over and rules being written, that was something that, you know, I personally really advocated for is having a, a tiered system um, instead of just one choice. Um, so you are the founder and CEO of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. Can you tell me how that sort of came about? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, you know, um, I spent about two years before the hemp bill was passed in Illinois reading and traveling around to various events across the Midwest, uh, really just trying to get a feel for the industry, um, do as much networking um, as I could. And uh, that kind of spiraled into lobbying for getting Illinois hemp bill passed. I was able to meet and work with some really amazing lobbyists Um, who shared their experience with me. Um, And as I was learning and gaining all this experience and um, meeting all these amazing people, it it just dawned on me that, you know, there's a place for me in this industry. My passion is huge. Um, And I became aware that there's a need, a big need for local options. There's a lot of big organizations out there. Mm -hmm. um, But we, we needed a local option um, and no one else was really doing what I envisioned, which was really just getting out there and hitting the community um, and, and being a voice for hemp in spaces that maybe hemp wasn't always, you know, this, the subject of conversation. Um, there's a lot of ag events and, and food events. I'm really plugged into the local food uh, movement here in Illinois. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a lot 
of places where hemp fits in. Um, and, you know, if most of the conversations about hemp are happening in the hemp space. <laughs> so it's, um, you know, it, I find a lot of joy in getting out of the hemp space into other spaces to talk about the benefits of hemp. Um, and I, I wanted something, you know, official. <laughs> so, uh, and to take it as far as I could really take it. Um, so that's when I, I, you know, I decided to make an organization out of it. Cool. And I see that you're a B corporation. What does, what does that mean? And why is that important? We are not a B Corp. We are a benefit corporation. There is a difference between oh, the two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, a benefit corporation. That. Sure. A benefit corporation is more like a C Corp. Um, and that, you know, you can have like, it's like a corporation you, you take in profit. Um, but with a benefit corporation, a, in addition to profit being a part of our legally defined goals, um, it includes positive impact on society, workers, the community, the environment. Um, and, you know, that's a big part of why we want to do what we want to do is to have those, you know, make those positive impacts. That's that's really our mission is, is just to get out there in the community and, and spread the word about hemp and um, help raise awareness and uh, educate those who, who need to know about it. Right, right people before profits that, that kind that's of thing. Ex that's exactly yeah. yes that's exactly what we do people before profits when you're sort of reaching out to the larger non-hemp community what is the reaction like how do how do people um take you and, and what you're doing yeah okay so there's kind of two sides to that as a woman and a male-dominated industry um that can be a little tricky um people you know just because you're a woman may not take you as seriously but also just believing that hemp can you know be a major crop or economically viable in the future you know some people need a little convincing for that and you know the cannabis stigma doesn't really help either right um yeah <laughs> so how how do you talk to people about that like how do you get around that stigma yeah, I would say that's the second part is that once you really start to talk to people about this and you, uh, a big part of my traveling around and, and being in the community is bringing all of these amazing things made of hemp along with me um, so that I can show people they can smell it, they can taste it, um, they can touch it, they can see for themselves, you know, that hemp is not just, you know, it's not the stigmatized version of, of what we think cannabis is. It's a lot more. Um, and, and once people, I, I have such an amazing time doing this because the light bulb really goes off in people's heads. I think that for the most part, they really, when they can touch it, um, you know, have that tactile connection, mm -hmm. they really get it. Um, and it's been, an, it's been amazing. It, it keeps me, you know, getting out there going as much as I can. Right. Yeah. Um, you bring up a really good point that like the hemp community needs to get out in the larger community because otherwise we're just you know, all preach into the choir here. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in the state of Illinois, um, you said like a lot of farmers are growing for CBD, but there is maybe some movement towards grain and fiber. Um, I guess that this organization, your Hemp Growers Association, sort of connects you with the, the community of farmers. Um, how sort of, you know, what's the, the lay of the land out there? How how many farmers are growing hemp? Um, just, you know, what's it like? Sure. Yeah, we have, I think in 2019, we came up with about 650 growers and 5,000 acres harvested. Mm. I think 93 or something like that percent of that was CBD. Mm. Um, and I expect that the numbers for CBD in 2020 are going to be very similar. Um, but we have had a lot of interest in um, fiber and grain just through our association. Um, and we even help source uh, fiber seeds for some farmers in our membership. Um, we source seeds for ourselves and we um, took a bulk order amongst our members. And once that seed came in from across the sea, uh, we distributed it. So you, you said you're growing for grain at your farm. What's the process like? Do you have to sort of like cure the seed or, or dry it? What, what do you do once you harvest the seed? Once you harvest the seed, what we're going to do is we're just going to hand process it. So once we get out there and we check that, you know, the seeds looking ripe, you know, a good amount of the seed heads are, you know, are not fresh and green looking anymore. 
we're going to bring them in and probably give them a good shake um, over a sheet or over a tablecloth, something like that. Just very simple, uh, hand done. If, it, if we need to trim stuff off, that's how we're going to do it. But um, yeah, this year we plan to just do it, you know, really getting acquainted with the plant using our senses, you know, let let our taste buds and our um, our eyes, our hands tell us when the seed is ripe, because this is our first year doing this. We've only seen it done in pictures and videos before. Mm -hmm. So getting the chance to really experience it for ourselves this year, every little step of the way, um, make our notes, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, and then next year we, we plan to scale up and then we'd like to do, you know, maybe buy a, a, an oil press, hmm. um, you know, something like that and just try, um, you know, smaller scale cottage scale solutions to what we want to do. Right. Um, I was under the impression that once you harvest the seed, you have to sort of like dry it down to a certain um, percent humidity. Otherwise it starts to like heat up itself. Are you, have you looked into any of that? Yes. Yes. And that is definitely true. If you're going to be storing stuff, mm -hmm. um, I think we, I guess I'm being very specific and to my farm, um, we, we, you know, our grain, we're going to eat most of it pretty quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, and we're waiting for it to be like dry and, um, ready to eat basically off the plant out there. Okay. Um, when you're, when you're harvesting really large scale, it's hard to, you know, to gauge that many plants. Right. So you do have to like kind of set and wait periods of time for larger scale and volume. Mm -hmm. um, but we are working at such a small scale that we'll, we'll pretty much be harvesting when they are ready. And then we can just bring them into the house or wherever we're prep preparing them. And, you know, we'll take it for the, from there. Okay. Um, so you do some other sort of work in the hemp space. Uh, I was looking on your website for the Grower Association and it talks about the tiny hemp houses building team. What is that? Yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago during my uh, self-education of hemp, I took a trip down to Colorado and I worked with John Patterson in tiny hemp houses, which is learning how to work with hempcrete, um, hemp lime building construction. Um, and that was an amazing big team. I think there were like 25 of us, um, you know, just learning the basics of how, how hemp lime construction works um, and applica application process. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really fun. It was none of the the fancier stuff like spraying and, and stuff like that, but it was a lot of teamwork and hands-on and um, packing the walls. Um, and that experience, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> I've never uh, traveled for manual labor before, <laughs> but I had a really good time despite the Colorado heat. Um, and that, it just inspired me, like just the amazing ability of hemp lime building and how it's been used for so long throughout history right. um, and, and what it can do in the future. You know, I, I come from a community that it can really benefit from clean homes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, you know, degradation in, in the places that we live. Um, and, and just having that experience and being able to um, not only like say this to my community, but show up with raw ingredients and explain to them how this works. Right. Uh, it's, it's really fun. Have you done any um, hemp lime projects on your farm? Not yet. Not yet. I've done several like little ones away from the farm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, what I want to do, what is making me not build with it yet on my farm or experiment is I wanted to grow the fiber myself. Right. Right. <laughs> um, I have a 120 year old farmhouse that could use, you know, a little renovation here or there, but I'm really hell bent on growing that fiber that I want to use um, myself and my husband has some training and experience in mechanics. So I, I'm even uh, rallied him to build me a small scale decor care nice. <laughs> so that I can, I can grow this on my farm and use it on my farm, which is a big, another big reason why I started the association. I, I just wanted to empower people um, that you can do this. Yeah. You can, you can help clothe yourself, um, build for yourself and feed yourself growing this crop. Imagine that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, it's exciting. Um, so what what other concerns do you have about the industry? Are you following any of the, the DEA interim rules that are, are going around right now? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we are following that pretty closely. And we've been, we've been reading as much as we can. Um, we're coming up with a blog post right now that will be out 
in the next couple of days um, that really gets our thoughts out about that and what we can do um, together to move forward. But yeah, there's a lot of anxiety out there. Right. Like some people on one side, they're saying like, oh, this is, you know, a major blow to the CBD industry. Other folks are like, no, this is actually just fine. So yeah, I'm curious to see what, what happens. Us too. Um, so getting back to the Illinois Hemp Growers Association, how many members do you have and sort of what is the benefit for membership? Sure. Yeah, we're a grassroots membership uh, organization and we have kind of two tiers of membership. Um, we have the grassroots level, which is free, um, and that really gets you kind of plugged into what we're doing. You get updates through our website. Um, it, it just kind of forms a better relationship. Uh, you know, we have your information and likewise on file. Um, and then we have our dues paying members. Um, they pay $25 a year and they get access to members only pages. They get invited to quarterly meetings. Um, and we have like quite a close relationship with our dues paying members and we have a hundred of them now, which is mm. so exciting for us. We just hit that a uh, hundred mark. Um, but we have developed quite a co close relationship with a lot of our members, uh, regular correspondence, um, just updating each other on how things are going. Um, so that's been really exciting and, um, you know, amazing to see how that has developed. Um, over time to that, that relationship with our, our paying members. Right. Um, and then we also of offer sponsorship um, to organizations and businesses, uh, startups here in Illinois and in the Midwest um, that want to, you know, support us and have mutual support from us and just help get the word out about their services and, um, you know, their membership programs, et cetera. Right. Yeah. I saw on your website, lots of great sponsors here. Um, What's that process like of finding sponsors and getting them to, you know, sign up? I uh, actually we we typically don't look for sponsors. They come to us, um, and uh, things get slow. And then they, you know, the, with the pandemic, things slow down, and we weren't getting a whole lot of action, not a whole lot of members or sponsors. But um, just in the last couple of weeks, things have really picked up, and we've picked up a couple more sponsors. Um, that's it's great. it's really just a part of a big part of it is networking like who are we talking to um one sponsor will tell another group that you know they've had a good experience and um then we'll start a conversation and it, it's really just organic you know we just find each other <laughs> <laughs> right um you mentioned the pandemic how how is that affecting you know your farm personally or you know the larger community what's it like out there in illinois oh i think it's pretty stressful for everybody you know it's trying to find a new rhythm um being cut off from resources that we usually have you know um, farming a big part of that is community um so being cut off from community community has been a challenge in many ways um but there's also been some you know, some good points, some highlights, being able to spend more time um, on the farm has, mm -hmm. has really been a highlight of, of all of this. Right. Um, so are, are you, you're full-time farmers or is there off farm work? I'm a full-time farmer. Okay. My husband has a career outside of the farm. Okay. And then do you have like a, a produce operation or a CSA or what, what else is going on farming wise there? No, uh, you know, we don't do CSA or um, farmer's market at this point. We pretty much grow to help our own gro grocery budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then we, we share with family, with oh, our wow. relatives. But right. that we do, we do aspire to do farmer's market, not just for produce, but, you know, I'm really interested in um, selling hemp baked goods, kind of cottage food style at mm -hmm. the farmer's market. And I made some really beautiful hemp bouquets this year from wildflowers and you know, and some hemp plants. So, you know, stuff like that. Um, we're interested in getting out there and marketing. Right, right. Um, so I follow you on the Instagram and I saw a couple of weeks ago, you posted a photo of feral hemp. Now that to me here in Pennsylvania, that's sort of a foreign concept that there would just be like these great stands of of wild hemp. Can you talk about that and sort of where that stuff comes from? Yeah, there's actually uh, still quite a bit of feral hemp all over Illinois that um, remains from back in the day when we had about 11 hemp mills here and they were processing fiber during World War II. 
Um, so yeah, there's still quite a bit of this feral hemp, even though years were spent spraying it, burning it down, you know, terrorizing farmers over nothing uh, because this feral plant is growing in their, in their space. Uh, we, we were really fortunate to get to visit that little patch of Illinois green. Uh, one of our members invited us out to come check out his uh, hemp harvest. He had just cut down some fiber and some of it was redding and he just failed some, another bit of it. So we came out to check it out and, and see how that went. And he said, hey, by the way, I've got this big old patch of Illinois green over there if you want to <laughs> check it out. And of course we did. Um, and it was amazing. You know, some of it was close to 20 feet tall. Wow. And, you know, what, do people use it for anything? I mean, is it illegal to have on your property or what? what's sort of the, the take on that? Well, you, well, to have hemp on your property, you're supposed to have a hemp processor or a hemp grower's license. So I guess that's kind of a gray area. Yeah, right. I mean, the police and the, and the Department of Ag have been trying to get rid of this for decades and it just grows anyway, um, which makes it, um, you know, desirable. We have the Illinois Extension offices here through the department, or rather through the um, universities who are really interested in the feral hemp. Um, we have a lot of um, researchers interested in these varieties that have survived all of that spraying and burning and right. um, cutting back over the decades. And, you know, we, like I said, we have these plants that are 20 feet tall. So I, I think there there's some desirability just to understand the genetics of how this plant has survived. Right. Like from a breeding point of view, it would seem perfect to have you know, some of those genes in, you know, in a, a, a variety that's specific to your area, something that has thrived for so long on its own. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I imagine people have done tests on it. Can, do you know anything about like the cannabinoid levels in this feral hemp? I do not know any about the specific, this specific feral hemp, or, I mean, I think all of that research is still being done. Mm. Um, and there are a couple of great researchers working on that. I know Philip Alberti, um, with the University of Illinois Extension um, is kind of spearheading that research of if, if, if you're a farmer uh, and you're aware that um, hemp is out there and you're aware of us, please let us know that it's there because they want to come take samples. Yeah. Um, okay. So the research is being done. Right. And that's not just in Illinois. I, I imagine there's feral hemp all over the Midwest. Sure. Yeah. Wisconsin, Nebraska, uh, Minnesota, you bet. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What are the, the bright spots that you see sort of in the hemp industry? Like where, where are we going? For me, it's all fiber and grain, you know, getting nutrient dense food to communities that need it um, and getting uh, affordable options, getting the hemp building um industry far enough along that it's not just a, a niche pretty thing for rich people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something that we can all uh, benefit from, you know, especially in communities that really need access to clean housing. Um, right. So that's, that's where I see the future moving. That's where my passion is. That's where I want to see things move. I love CBD. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I just, you know, we need this, um, and future generations need it too. Amen to that. Yeah, I feel the same way. CBD is fantastic, but it's not the end all be all of hemp. There's so much more, mm -hmm. you know, we mm -hmm. could be doing so much. Yeah. And doing the work to, um, you know, create standards, help create standards in the industry for, you know, all of the things that need standards so that this can be, you know, adopted in at a large scale, you know, yeah. which is going to be fiber and grain. <laughs> yep. So that's, yeah, that's what I want to see. Yeah, me too. So is there anything else you want to mention? The only other thing I could plug is that we're having a membership meeting coming up um, in September via Zoom. It's on the 24th. Um, we have lots of rooms. So if you want to be involved and you're not a member yet, you can head to our website um, and we'll get you on the list. Okay. Do you have to be a grower in Illinois to join the meeting? You do not. You do not have to be a grower in Illinois. Most okay. so far, I think just about everybody is. But yeah. um, if you are a grower in another state that is curious and wants to join the conversation, please become a member, and we'd be happy to have you. Okay. Um, in some states, there's like a push to 
outlaw the smokable flower industry? Like I think Texas is trying to do that. Is there any, and maybe Indiana, which is sort of closer to home for you, is there any pushback against the smokable flower market out there? I wouldn't say there's a pushback. There's definitely a market for the smokable flower. Um, but we did have a, I'm trying to see if I have it in my notes, what it what it's actually called. Give me one sec. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't write down what the policy is called, but we have a policy that allows for hemp biomass and extracts to be sold to medicinal and adult use cultivation centers here in Illinois um, for infused products. Hmm. And the fact that it's only for the biomass and the extracts and not the smokable flour, you know, that's that's not great. Um, th- that was supposed to be a push to help uh, hemp growers and producers have a market for their product. Right. But that exclusion of the smokable flour, um, you know, not super favorable. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right. um, do growers out there have a hard time finding processors? We have a lot of processors here in Illinois. Um, sometimes there is a little disconnect and we'll get phone calls that some uh, farmer needs a processor and we can help plug them in with a couple options. But I would not say there is a shortage of processors in Illinois. No. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, and does the state provide, you know, like access to those? Like, uh, is there a list? Like if you were a grower, could you go to the, the ag department's website and find all of the processors? You would actually find that list with um, ourselves during with a collaboration with the Chicago Cannabis Company and the Illinois Extension offices. Oh, okay. um, the Department of Ag, I don't think they have a list of processors. They have a list of labs and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But um, we came up with, we collaborated amongst some Illinois organizations to come up with that list of processors and we keep it updated. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can find that on our website in the file share. You can seek that out with um the Illinois Extension offices as well. Okay. Do you need a license in Illinois to be a processor? You do, yes. It is a separate license from the hemp grower's license. All right. Well, Rachel Berry, it is great to talk to you. I'm glad we connected. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on the show, Eric. It's been a blast. Yeah, and it's great to talk to you, um, you know, because I talk to so many like dudes in the hemp space. So I'm always happy to find... Um, farmers who also happen to be women. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, big, that's a big reason why I'm doing this too. Just there need to be more women in the industry. Um, and it's not easy, but you know what? I'm going to, I'm going for it. Yeah. I imagine you just bump up against so many, it's just like stupid things, you know, (laughs) in like the, yeah. Like I tried to express articulately earlier, like the stigma is a big thing. Just, you know, just big old white, dude farmers who are like okay lady you know i'm five foot tall (laughs) so they're like oh this five foot tall woman is gonna try to tell me something that i don't know like yeah right it's not gonna happen (laughs) but you know like i said when you show them well let me pull this thing out of my hemp briefcase you know and show you this then you know their their tone and their posture kind of changes right when you give them that tactile example of you know, instead of just your words, yeah. you know, their attitude changes a little bit. They, they loosen up a little bit. Good. Um, how about from like a, oh, apparently we're back into the interview, but <laughs> how about <laughs> That's like fine. from like a social, social justice point of view, do you think the hemp and or cannabis industry like has a responsibility when it comes to, you know, communities of color being decimated by you know these stupid drug laws for the past oh absolutely absolutely (laughs) it's it's crazy that um it's not just more obvious to everybody and that the industry is still struggling to be inclusive of minorities um when yeah in fact uh, yes all of the things that you just said (laughs) absolutely yes and that's you know like i said it's in our mission to um help uh mold the industry in Illinois and as far reaching as we can into something more inclusive. Yeah. Um, we need, we need more voices. Like right. we need more perspectives. Well, how, like, how do you do that? Like it's, I guess it's easy to talk about, but like, what would that look like in real terms? Do you think? 
Well, for me, it's literally going out to the community and places, you know, like I'm from Chicago. So uh, I will go out to the inner city as often as I can and just share about hemp um, mm-hmm. because we to ha- just to like help empower those communities. Like when you're like they they want education in the city and um, just as much as they want out here rurally. Um, so and and they're not always that's the big thing is it's not always the hemp space like the hemp space is so it's like kind of exclusive. So if you want to share hemp with, um, you know, a further reach into the community, you have to go to places that are not hemp spaces. Um, you have to show up where people are talking about how they get their food. You know, you have to show up to places um, where they're talking about, uh, you know, what what's another one that I really like to hit up different types of it's food is the big one I like to show up at um, places that are talking about local food. And usually, you know, they're talking all about produce and, um, you know, herbs and stuff like that. But I show up and I talk about hemp because this is something that you can grow, you know, that's got tons of, it's nutrient dense. So like it's a little more bang for your buck um, compared to other things you might want to grow. And then, yeah, the other space I get into is building space or the fashion space. Like I try to you know, get my foot in the door in those little spaces um, in environmental discussions. That is a, another big one, the food and the environment. Yeah. There's so much talk about how we can um, help the environment and help um, curb some of these ag practices that are detrimental to the environment and these precious ecosystems that exist everywhere. Um, interjecting hemp into that, like, hey, by the way, we have hemp as an ally. Right. It doesn't have to be all, um, I don't know, all the other ways of conservation. You know, we have hemp as an ally. Let's not forget. Right. And it's so good at, you know, sequestering carbon. And, you know, it's uh, the guy I interviewed a couple of years ago now, um, Bruce Michael Dietzen, who made the, the sports car out of hemp. Do you remember that episode? I do. Yeah. He is so inspiring and he's got, you know, just great ideas. If we could even like... I think his percentage was like 16%. If we could convert like 16% of the things that we manufacture, you know, in this world now out of plastic, if we make those out of hemp, it would it would move the needle so much in in mitigating the climate change. And I yeah, think more, more people need to hear this. And um, yeah. Yep, I completely so, agree. Yeah. And so, the more we work together and have these conversations, um, and encourage each other to get out there, um, especially during the pandemic. You know, it's been so, it's it's been difficult, but yeah. uh, the more we keep at it, and the, the better it's going to be in the long run. Right. Um, we just got to collaborate and keep up the keep up the good work. Essentially, that's Rachel Berry, founder and CEO of the Illinois Hemp Growers Association. I will have a link to the Illinois Hemp Growers Association on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening to today's show. You can always get in touch with me. You can send an email to podcast at LancasterFarming.com. My name is Eric Herlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Check us out online or get yourself a subscription to our print edition and we'll just send it to you every week. You can learn about all of that at LancasterFarming.com. All right, well, so that does it for our 100th episode. Thank you for listening to this one. Thank you for listening to all of them. I don't know. Have you listened to all of these 100 episodes? Congratulations if you have, because that's quite an undertaking. Anyway, um, thanks again. I've really enjoyed this work that I'm doing. And I do believe I'm going to take a little break from the podcast for now. So hopefully we'll see you in a few weeks uh, or in the newspaper.
industrial hemp. Um, um, yeah. Farmers are still waiting for non-drug um, regulatory guidance for CBD. What can be done to get F the FDA to act before farmers like hemp farmers like the ones in your state of Kentucky abandon the crop? Uh, honestly, I'm not on top of the latest on that. Episode 100 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast, copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by Eric Murlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Timber Jetta. Black Lives Matter. 